that deal with the technologies in, well, in our case, we're, we're, we're here, technologies in schools, and this is a computer, it's my own, where's my computer? In my pocket, okay. <laughs> Yesterday we heard some statistics, we heard some statistics this morning, when I'm talking to parents, teachers, and kids, and I say teachers, I'm meaning anybody in the educational system, administrators, uh, superintendents, counselors, nurses, whoever it happens to be, I asked them how many kids in school have something like this with them, or have access to this during the school day. The answers used to be way back in the day, five, 10 years ago, used to be, oh, a handful, and it went up to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Now, elementary through high school, the answers are up to the 90s to 95, to just about 100% of the kids have access to something. That's important to keep in mind because we're going to talk about so what? What does this mean in the terms of bullying and cyberbullying and in terms of what we're talking about today? So let's get moving here. First of all, just piggybacking off of what Peter just said, not all negative, socially unacceptable, things you don't like behavior is bullying. This is important. Um, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago that I have conversations with parents all over, this, all over the country, all over the state, school folks, uh, you name it. Uh, anybody who wants to have a conversation on all this kind of stuff will give me a call. Teachers, principals, administrators, and lots and lots of parent calls. In fact, McClure, yep, <laughs> we talked. I'm not sure about the conversation with the parent that, that Ellen was talking about because that's one that I would have remembered but it didn't come to mind right away. But I've had some doozy calls from parents and teachers and administrators. One of the first things to say, just because you don't like it doesn't mean that it's bullying. And secondly, regardless of what the media says, bullying is not an epidemic. Bullying is not an epidemic. The numbers we're talking about basically run the same across the world, 20%-ish, up or down, depending on how you ask the questions. 20% of the kids are involved in bullying. Basically, 100% of the kids are involved in bullying because the rest of us, adults included, are part of the bystander group. But those who are victimized or victimizers, 20%-ish, eh, up and down the line. So keeping that in mind, Peter just walked through this really quickly. And the pieces that come to mind, the critical pieces of our state definition in, in the shorthand that we use within Washington, we talk about HIV, HIV, not HIV, harassment, intimidation, or bullying. When I talk to people, whether it's staff or parents or kids, we talk about the small words in this part of the, in this definition. The small words are the ors. Question we often get, does it have to be everything to be HIV? be harassment, intimidation, or bullying, the answer is no. It's the or, the or, the or, the or. And the one or that really causes confusion within our state, and this is not unusual across states, but the one or that really causes confusion for folks in the school settings is the or, the or on top of the arrow. We're talking harassment, intimidation, or bullying. Harassment, intimidation, or bullying. They're connected, they're joined at the hip, one often leads to another, but they're not the same. They're not exactly the same. Definitionally nor legally are they the same. Sexual harassment, <coughs> discretionary, or just, uh, discriminatory harassment is not necessarily the same as bullying, although one can lead to the other. Okay, so far so good? With that in mind, <coughs> back to that CDC definition, one of the things we're trying to really move forward is if we're teasing out bullying, what is bullying per se? What is bullying per se? And the CDC definition is really excellent. As Ellen walked through the definition, the piece that was left out there, which really is the kind of confusing part, is who are not siblings or current dating partners. We have to talk about that with our, with our folks in schools. Now, we know that there's a relationship between what kids learn at home because bullying is a learned behavior and often it's learned from siblings unless you or parents or somebody else at home. And when uh, Michelle was talking earlier, the 
question that I had for her afterwards was uh, late night abuse by dating partners using technologies. How about some data on that? We know that those kinds of things we have in conversation. But those are pulled out uh, out of this definition or not for specific purposes, for research purposes. The CDC definition also limits this definition of bullying to kids in school. David Finkelhor out of New Hampshire defines sexting in terms of kids in school. So we're trying to limit this conversation to just what we're dealing with with K-12 situations. Backing up to our state HIV definition, the question that often comes up is, does this apply to adults? Our state HIV harassment, intimidation, and bullying statute does not apply to adults on adult situations, but it does apply to adult kid, kid, adult, adult, kid, kid, adult. Those are rare that we get those conversations because usually if that's happening, the adults are kind of embarrassed. They want to talk about a kid bullying them. The reverse is not so much embarrassing. We do get conversations about adults bullying kids. Okay. So, so far so good. A lot of those same words repeat themselves with the power and balance, repeatedness, the harm, the, uh, the emotional harm, and educational harm. Cyberbullying, as, as uh, Ellen mentioned, lots of definitions around cyberbullying. When I talk to kids, looking around the room here, probably wouldn't happen so much here. When I talk to kids, they say, Mr. Donovan, or Mike, depending on how well I know them. Why are you talking about cyberbullying? That's just bullying. There's no difference. I say, yes, in your world, the 21st century world of young folks, there is no distinction, there's no difference between digital and bricks and mortar. It's, it's all of a piece. We heard about the, uh, the kids having their stuff late at night. You know, when my son was in my high school, my college son was in high school, this was by his bed, dropped by his ear, plugged in, charging every night. Just in case. You never know. Fortunately, he slept through the night, he didn't, he didn't get too much stuff late at night. But just in case, because this is this is like underwear and clean socks and breakfast. You gotta have it. This is part of what we do in our life today. So Bullying and cyberbullying are the same. Uh, cyberbullying is bullying that takes place, and this is the definition through uh, the, a couple of solid resources just as working definitions. The uh, stopbullying.gov site and then Kanduja and Hatchin was there for a long standing research and work. So, just to put it in a context, cyberbullying is bullying that takes place through electronic media. Now, as Peter mentioned, cyberbullying and bullying are not criminal behaviors per se, but what young folks don't understand is that they can easily lead to criminal behaviors, and within the state of Washington, the criminal code defines cyber stalking, and so cyberbullying may turn into, may become cyber stalking. <clears throat> In talking to educators, parents, and even the kids, Document, document, document. Know exactly what you're talking about. Get as much information and investigate as deeply as you can. It may become a legal matter. It may become a police matter. So just be very, very careful. These are the kinds of things now, backing up a step. In the public schools in, in Washington State, there are over a million kids. And we also work a lot with the private schools to so add another couple hundred thousand kids, or however many there are. On top of that, <clears throat> 295 school districts, Teachers, uh, certificated, certificated staff, administrators, ESAs, all across having to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. And lots of questions about, so what does this mean to me and how do I deal with these ors and these subtleties and the distinctions between this and that. So, one of the big questions when dealing with cyber, I'm kind of jumping here from moving quickly through these things. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is a little bit of a, meta presentation, when I talk to different people at different points in time, we get different things. And as Peter mentioned, the First Amendment, one of the things I hear from parents and from schools is, well, this is happening online, so we've got no authority to do anything about it. Hmm. Surprisingly. Well, 
Yes, you do. Maybe. Because the First Amendment doesn't give you, doesn't give people the right to scholar obscenities or libel or slander or threat or hurt, so anything like that. You gotta make sure you know what you're talking about. The next one is, uh-oh, this comes up quite a bit too. This thing's here, floating in and out of schools. We know this stuff happened. Uh, something's going on. Kids are talking about it, maybe. Maybe they're telling, maybe they're not. You hear something. Do we have the right to search and search and seize, seize and search cell phones because we think something's going on? And the answer to that, well, in a nutshell, the Fourth <coughs> Amendment says no unreasonable search and seizure is probable cause and something very specific has to be the case. So for schools, it's not so much the probable cause as reasonable suspicion. Here's where the catch comes in for schools. Reasonable suspicion that something has been broken, some rule, some policy, something has been broken, that there's a need to do this. And you have to be very, very sure what those are and what you're looking for, and very limited in scope to do a search of someone's cell phone. The caution is to anybody in a school setting, don't even go there. Bring it, talk to your legal counsel first, families and parents. You don't want to take on that liability, again, as Peter mentioned, that liability of jumping into something and going, oh my God, I'm looking for a drug deal and I see naked pictures of a kid. Uh, don't want to do that. I put all these pictures up here of all these different cell phones because part of the question is, hold up mine before, this is an iPhone 5. It's been a long time since I used my old, old, old flip phone. When I know how to go back and find things on that flip phone, if somebody has a different different uh, piece of technology, you want to take responsibility for searching that piece of technology for one specific thing and knowing exactly how to find it. So the answer to, to this is, is it legal? Is it possible? Big time it depends. And bottom line, don't go there. So these are the kinds of questions that come up. Anybody familiar with SIPA? The Children's Internet Protection Act. The Children's Internet Protection Act requires certain things of schools. And this is what is the this is what the law that requires schools to have filters on their systems and requires people to write out permissions. Yes, I will be good and I'll use my stuff. We won't let kids look at pornography and so on and so forth. I'm going to monitor what they're doing. How about E rate? Ooh, yay. E-Rate is the Universal Services Pro Administration. E-Rate gives money back to schools, to school districts, not to school, but to school districts, for what they spend on certain areas in technology, for their networks and so on and so forth. To be eligible to get E-Rate money, we're talking dollars now, to be eligible to get E-Rate money, school districts have to be SIPA compliant which means they have to have their filter, they have to do this, they have their three or four things that they have to do. In 2008, it seems like ages ago, the Broadband Data Improvement <coughs> Act had a section on this which is called Protecting Children in the 21st Century, and that said that we will teach, we will teach internet safety and cyberbullying awareness and response. Not only will we teach it, but we have to teach it we have to put this into our school board policy that says we are teaching it in order to be SIPA compliant to get money. One of the few and first first few times when there's this this kind of this this uh, you know, it's type of right, if you don't do it right. So far, nobody's been um, out of compliance because they're not teaching internet safety. But the challenge there comes into who's going to be doing this. Who teaches this?